Hello, and welcome to Millis 02054, a show that brings matters of interest to Millis. My name is Kathy McGinnis, and today we're at beautiful South End Pond. I am most pleased to welcome Kathy Lannon, a lifelong Millis resident and former 20 plus year member of the Millis Board of Health. First off, Kathy, thanks very much for continuing to assist the Board of Health regarding matters of interest to Millis residents. By the end of Kathy's presentation, we will know what are PFAS, what items contain PFAS, how can we be exposed, how can we reduce exposure, what is being done to eradicate PFAS in our lives, and why neither Kathy nor I is wearing makeup or lipstick. <laughs> Welcome, Kathy. What are PFAS? Um, PFAS are a group of human-made chemicals. There's about 5,000 of them. They're also known as per and polyfluoroalkyl substances. They're, they have chains of carbon atoms surrounded by many fluorine atoms. The two that we might, uh, as consumers, be aware of are, um, is PFOA, which was uh, branded by DuPont as Teflon, invented in 1938 and taken off the market in 2015. And PFOS, branded by 3M Corporation as Scotchgard, that was invented in 1952 and was taken off the market in 2002. These chemicals' properties include resistance to water, grease, oil, and um, heat. And they're now commonly known as forever chemicals because we now know, because of the carbon fluoride bonds, they persist in the environment. Um, perhaps forever, and they have an affinity for water, including surface water and groundwater. Um, in, in 2020, the Mass Department of um, Environmental Protection developed a standard for the amount of six of these chemicals in our drinking water, and that level was determined to be 20 parts per trillion, which is why we're talking about PFAS today. Um, to give you an idea of how much PFAS that is in the groundwater, uh, one part per trillion is about equal to four grains of sugar in an Olympic-sized swimming pool. Wow, Kathy. Please tell us what items contain PFAS. Well, because of their properties, they essentially, to paraphrase a common sauce ad, they put this stuff in everything. Uh, so. We can't talk about all the places it is, but we'll focus on where it is in our households. Uh, they can be in stain and water resistant clothing, fabrics, rugs, curtains, um, all kinds of other textiles. They can be in packaging, including food packages, other containers for other products, nonstick cookware, um, household cleaners and polishes, and personal care products and cosmetics. Can you tell us more ways we can be exposed? Well, there's, first of all, there's three main ways, potential ways of exposure. The um, first is that we ingest it or swallow it. The second is we inhale um, PFAS that have become uh, gaseous chemicals for a period of time. And we can be exposed through skin contact. Right now, skin absorption is not thought to be a major source of us absorbing this chemical, so we'll focus mostly on ingestion and inhalation of these chemicals. So the, the first source of PFAS is ingestion, um, swallowing PFAS. Of course, we know that we can swallow it in water, which is why the state develops standards for the levels of it in drinking water. Um, it can also occur through the consumption of foods. What we now know about PFASs in general is not only do they persist forever in the environment, but they also accumulate in our bodies, as well as the um, bodies of other animals and in plants. So that's why food consumption is a second consideration after water consumption. Um, that's called bioaccumulation. And if you think about what foods it may be in, the most 
common food product it's found in is in seafood and fish. And if you think about the fact that they're animals that live, not only drink the water, but live in the water, that's not surprising. Uh, it can also occur in animal products that we eat, like meats, dairy, um, and finally can occur in plants that are grown in areas with high PFAS levels in the water and are fertilized with fertilizers that contain PFAS. Now the FDA has done some testing on food products and that's a big topic, but certainly uh, that's more to come on the levels of PFAS in the food that, food, food that we eat. Uh, but one of my things that broke my heart is in some of the original testing, they found high level of PFAS in a chocolate cake purchased no. at a supermarket. Um, they, um, they also, you can also ingest PFAS we now know through food containers that are coated with PFAS because of its grease and water resistant properties. And since 1966, the FDA has allowed PFAS to be used in food containers and all containers. And since then they have stopped the use of some PFAS in containers, but they continue to use other newer PFASs in food wrappings and containers as well. Um, an example of a food product that's gotten more press concerning PFAS is uh, popcorn, microwave popcorn bags um, have, can contain PFAS, of course, because of the grease and the whatever they use for the popcorn. And um, the good news is there, that has received enough attention that some of the PFAS products have been taken out of some popcorn bags. Uh, another example is dental floss can contain PFAS. And though we don't ingest dental floss, we do use it in our mouths in the area of our gums, which have a very good blood supply. So as I said, uh, skin exposure right now is not thought to be a major route that we um, absorb PFAS, but there are, but it is in many, many of our personal care products, like cosmetics, skin creams, and uh, I think one of the reasons of concern about cosmetics especially is lipstick. And we all know that those of us who have worn lipstick that it has to be reapplied. So this may be uh, a source of ingestion as well as some skin exposure. Um, a third and final way that PFAS, we can be exposed to PFAS and absorb it is through inhalation. And this is actually where I came into the PFAS story about 20 years ago when acquaintances told me that their pet birds in cages shouldn't be kept near the kitchen because PFAS expo exposure to uh, cookware in use could cause the birds to die. Made me think of canaries in a, in a um, I'm having a senior moment, uh, canaries in a cave. So I went and did some research and did find out 20 years ago that there is a thing called Teflon toxicosis in birds. They can indeed die from inhaling fumes from nonstick cookware. Since then, um, more information has come about nonstick cookware. Uh, we, you know, we, we all purchase nonstick cookware. I usually read directions, and I certainly don't remember any directions coming with my nonstick cookware. I now know that it shouldn't be heated above 450 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, we all use food thermometers to measure our food, but you can't use those to measure the temperature in the pan. You need an infrared thermometer. My uh, nonstick cookware didn't come with one, but we now know that uh, because the pan's designed to absorb and retain heat, the temperatures in the pan can be much higher than the temperatures in your oven or the temperature on your stove. So that above 450 degrees, gases can escape from the coating of the nonstick cookware um, into the air and you can inhale it. As a matter of fact, when I was looking at the research about Teflon and bird exposures, I found that occupational exposures like cooks who were using nonstick cookware repeatedly reported symptoms 
that they called the Teflon flu, like fever and body aches, typical flu symptoms. And later on in a court case, uh, discovery from that court case showed that at DuPont, researchers were aware that this could occur in workers in the factories making Teflon cookware, and they called it polymer, polymer fume fever and reported flu-like symptoms in the workers as well. So in terms of nonstick cookware, even though newer PFASs are now used in nonstick cookware, the issue of not heating the pan above this 450 degree heat, which we're essentially unable to check for, uh, can occur. So one of the things that's generally recommended is never to heat your nonstick cookware on the, on the stovetop higher than medium heat. I included a graphic there showing some of the information that's known about when they off-gas and what some of the effects of off-gassing are from uh, nonstick cookware, and that is from the Environmental Working Group website. Secondly, the picture of the pan that I've shown, which was worse than the one I threw away, but certainly the integrity of the surface of the cookware it needs to be maintained so that PFASs don't come into the food or down your sink when you're washing the cookware. Um, so that it's important to, to only use cookware that doesn't have any scratches in it. A final way that we can ingest, ingest or perhaps swallow PFAS is the PFAS that settles in our household dust. Because these products are everywhere in our house and over time the surfaces such as stain resistant surfaces and the PFAS in the fabrics themselves are wearing away, household dust has been shown to contain high levels of PFAS. For example, one study of household dust found PFOA levels of five to 10,000 parts per trillion, per billion. And as you remember, um, or, as, or parts per billion is 1,000 times parts per trillion. So that's a significant amount of PFAS that can be found in household dust. And so that's why, for example, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended, first of all, to use, to prefer stainless steel cookware in uh, cast iron cookware as opposed to uh, nonstick cookware. And they recommended vacuuming as opposed to sweeping and uh, not dry dusting our surfaces. For example, I vacuum a lot more than I ever did and I use my brush attachment on my vacuum to dust my surfaces. Kathy, you mentioned uh, something about birds. What can you tell us about a very important part of our lives, our pets? Well, not, not a lot has been known about pets so far, but certainly pets are ex can be exposed to PFAS in their food products, because reportedly there is some meat in some pet foods, as well as PFAS absorbed through their containers. What little is known, for example, one reporter tested his home and himself and his pet for levels of PFAS. We, we know that, as I've said, PFAS can, uh, bio, can be retained in our bodies. In 1999, the, a portion of the C CDC did testing on a sample of people and found that 98% of them tested had five parts per billion of four PFASs tested in their blood. And he found when he tested the blood of himself and his cat, that his cat had more than five times more PFAS in its body than he did. So certainly pets are at the same risk of exposure that we are. And perhaps the reason uh, pets can have higher doses is they're closer to the ground. Some testing of pet products have occurred, very little so far. But one of the ones that initially surprised me was a testing of a pet product used for flea and tick prevention that's essentially put on the back of the pet. It had very high levels of PFAS. And of course, now that I think about it, I, under I realize that if that product is to stay on the pet for months, which is what the product advertises, then it probably has some water-resistant chemicals in it. So 
another uh, research that's been done on pets that indicates pets also are at risk is a plant in North Carolina that makes the next, um, the newer PFAS is used in nonstick cookware, had a large area of contamination around the plant in the water and ground. And testing of people and pets that lived in that area, they found that in general the dogs and the cats had higher levels of PFAS in their blood than the people did. Kathy, how can we, each of us reduce PFAS in our lives? Well, I think, first of all, understanding that this is a, a worldwide 60-year-old problem. PFASs have been put in a, so many products that we're only focusing on houseboat products. And if we want to follow the money, who bought those products? We did. And we will be paying to take six PFASs up out of our water today. Who knows? how many we'll be paying for in the future. So that one of the first things we can do as individuals is stop buying products for our households that contain PFAS. And you know that the, the bad news is it's everywhere. The good news is people and consumers have begun that process. It's a big job, Kathy. Where do we as consumers start? Well, there are some consumer websites that can be very helpful in terms of finding out which, which um, producers and products have taken PFAS out of their products and which retailers have agreed to not sell PFAS-related products. One of the best websites, one shop stopping websites for that information is called Safer Chemicals Healthy Families. That's on screen. The first part of their website has information about um, food, product, food wrappers that, and other food container products that have taken PFAS out. A simple thing you can do in terms of eating out at restaurants is instead of using their takeout containers, use this, your same plastic container over and over again, which is what I do. I bring it with me and I get a two for, for. I'm reducing my plastic use and I'm not using containers that may contain PFAS. Another part of that website, since food wrappers and takeout containers are a, have been a source of PFAS leaching into our food, has a site for restaurant owners to find retailers that sell food container products that don't contain PFAS. A third part of that website um, has the information about retailers that have already agreed to take PFAS out of their products, both food uh, wrapping type products as well as products in our household, household like rugs and fabrics and um, household products that don't contain PFAS. And um, another, another place to find information about cosmetics and personal products that contain PFAS is called um, Safe Chemicals. Dot org, and you can look up and see what um, companies have taken PFAS out of their personal products. Um, finally, besides us consumers pushing to not buy PFAS products for our home, we do need to look at government regulation concerning PFAS. Right now, there is a lot of states that are making um, changes in their regulations concerning PFAS products. And it's happening so fast that a website that you can find out what's being done state by state so far is, the, is called safestates.com. Where Massachusetts is not the only state that has taken the step of regulating PFAS in their drinking water. Um, some states have even begun the process of regulating taking PFAS out of household products. An example is California. Uh, lastly, in terms of federal regulation, there is a huge amount of agencies involved in the process of measuring PFAS, finding more out about what PFASs are in use and what products, and a place to start to advocate for that process to, to continue is a website called earthjustice.org, which kind of outlines for you 
what kinds of things we need to push, what kind of regulations we need to, first of all, identify PFAS, find out where it is, and uh, regulate how to get PFAS out of our products. Because we will be paying to take PFAS out of our water now, the six PFAS that the state of Massachusetts regulates. Because of the nature of these chemicals, having bonds that may never degrade in the environment and will circulate around the environment forever. Uh, we may be paying to get PFAS chemicals out of our water forever if we don't start doing some of these things now. Now, to reiterate what Kathy has said, at the end of the day, it is up to us consumers, you and me, to take care of ourselves. Know what we buy, what we consume, how we clean our residences, how we cook and store our meals, and taking care of our pets. Contact your legislators. Let them know that this is a priority issue with you and what are they doing to eradicate PFAS in our lives. Final thoughts, Kath? Well, I'd like to thank uh, John McVay, the director of Miller's Public Health, and a graduate student at the University of Lowell School of Public Health, Sean Fl Flaherty, for helping me prepare this information. They did a great job, yeah. and so did you, Kathy. Thank you very much. And on our next show, we will bring with you um, PFAS in our water. Thank you.